This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Lewis Harrell, assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Lewis as he continues teaching through God's Word. How can we live in a way that's pleasing to God? How can we live in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ by asking Him for knowledge of His will, asking Him for wisdom and spiritual understanding? And then it says that you may then walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. You want to please the Lord. I know you guys do. I do too. And the only way I can please Him is by knowing His Word and obeying what it says. It's the only way. There's no other way. These are good and honest questions that Pastor Clark is presenting to us today. Many deeply desire to honor God, but aren't sure where to start. Today, Pastor Clark lays out the clear map to follow as a guideline for your life. It's simple. Obey God's instructions and His ways laid out in the Bible. When you stay true to that, you're not led away by your own paths that lead to nowhere. God's Word gives life. It gives direction. It gives you what you need to know where to go next. It's your roadmap. Now here's Pastor Clark in 2 Timothy chapter 4 as he begins a new message, Christ is God in the flesh. Paul's dealing with a big problem because Pastor Epaphras has come to him from the city of Colossae and told Paul while he was in jail in Rome that the saints are being disturbed with false teaching, that people are coming into the church with lies and, and things that would confuse them. And Paul is the one that has been used by the Lord throughout the age of the early church when it first was developed and planted. And he's the one that God has used throughout the ages as we study the word of God around the world since it's been given to us. And so Paul tells us, I'm just going to read a preface verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is why he says the things he says. This is why he prays the way he prays. This is why he speaks to people like myself and other pastors to understand the seriousness of the responsibility we have to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Because this is what's happening back then. And this is what's happening today. He says in verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is occurring as we speak today in our own world. And it occurred back in the days that Paul was actually preaching and teaching. They will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so since the beginning of time, really in the, in the book of Genesis, the first thing that Lucifer the devil said to um, Adam and Eve was, has not God said? He twisted the scriptures to deceive them. And he did a good job. He did deceive them. And because of that, Eve sinned intentionally and Adam followed her lead. And the whole focus of the enemy is to circumvent the authority and deity and lordship of Jesus Christ. The reason the majority of people do not believe what you believe today and follow the one you follow, is because their minds have been infected by the poison of heresy, false religions, and the traditions of men. The Bible tells us, Jesus himself says, the traditions of men make the word of God of no impact. In other words, if you or me or anybody can bring something into the church that is contrary to the truth of the word of God, and we begin to follow that, then we've all fallen away from what the truth is. 
And this has been the problem since the beginning of, of time. And in the early church, Paul was constantly having to fight against the inertia that was always coming against the truth of the preaching of the word of God and exhort people to follow the teaching of the apostles that were given to them by Jesus Christ. So all your world religions, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Confucianism, Taoism, uh, false religions such as uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, every one of those groups deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So the devil's really smart. He knows if he can get you or me or anybody on the face of the earth to not believe that Jesus is God, he's got them. And he will take them down a path of destruction and eventual death and eternal punishment because they have not believed in the one that God has sent, the only begotten Son of God. So everything in the book of Colossians, in the city of Colossae, is focused on this issue of diminishing the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. The name above all names, it tells us in Philippians, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. That means all the Buddhists, all the Muslims, all the Hindus, all the people who are in false religions. One day they will realize when it's too late, they'll be forced to bow their knee and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ is superior. He is supreme. He is the greatest one. He is the prominent one. He is the predominant one. He is the exclusive one in the midst of the church at all times. Every time we gather, we worship Christ and him alone. The purpose of the church is to exalt Jesus Christ, to magnify Christ, to glorify Christ, to worship Christ. Everything is centered on Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. And any organization that diminishes the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ is a false religion. Isn't it interesting when you talk to people about your faith and you tell them what Jesus did to you, did for you, and did in you, and you begin to talk about the exclusiveness of salvation only being provided for in the person of Jesus Christ, that's when they start getting like uptight, right? Well, there's other ways to heaven, you know. All, all roads lead to heaven. There's other gods, you know. Your, your, your God isn't the only way. And then you tell them, you know, John 14, 6, what Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There is no other way. Well, that's narrow-minded. And Jesus says, the road that leads to life is narrow and few there are that find it. Jesus had the answer for every comeback, didn't he? I mean, any kind of like assault against the truth, Christ always had the perfect answer. And so here's Paul now, and he's starting in verse 9. We covered the verses 3 through 8, where Paul was thanking God for the salvation of all these people in, in the city of Colossae their love for Jesus Christ, their faith in Jesus Christ. He, he talked about uh, the fruit that was in their lives and how the influence of that church was impacting other people in the region around and people were coming to know Jesus because of what was happening in their lives. And he said to them in verse 6 about the fruit that's among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. So these people were established initially in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was no confusion. They had been set apart. They had been saved. They'd become born again. And they're in the truth. But the devil always wants to invade your life or mine or churches to bring in lies to negate the truth. And so today, many of your major denominations that at one time had some sensibility about what the truth of the gospel is, have left the truth of the gospel because they began to be impacted by the seductive forces of the enemy in the demonic realm to begin to teach lies. Well, it isn't really important that Jesus rose again. 
what's the big deal about a virgin birth? You know, negating the infrastructure and the foundational truths, what differentiates Christianity against other world religions? There is only one who rose again from the dead. The only one you would put your confidence in and faith in is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, he that believeth in me, he says, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. But he that believeth in me shall never die. No one else ever said that. No one else could ever say that because Christ is the only one that conquered the grave. And so Paul is building them up and thanking the Father for what they've done. But he knows the inside information because Epaphras was saying, Paul, I'm worried about these Christians. They're being influenced by these false teachers. They're starting to move away from their adoration and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. They're being told that they need other truth. They need to read other things. They need to experience other uh, situations in order to be full with spirituality. And it was a, a big deception. And so Paul knows the only answer to uh, thwarting the lie of the devil is preaching the word, but also praying. And we talk about the importance of prayer here, just through even the, the vision of a Christian school or whatever it is that God's going to do in and through your lives in this church, is that everything starts with prayer, doesn't it? Nothing changes without prayer. Jesus exemplified before us that he spent time all the time with the Father in prayer, understanding that without Christ we can do nothing. Nothing will change. Nothing will be transformed. Nothing will ever occur in your life apart from the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ in regard to your own spiritual transformation of becoming more like Jesus every day won't happen apart from the grace of God, the work of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. No one can get saved apart from the power of God. No one can come to Christ unless Christ draws him. No one can be born again except by the work of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can happen apart from the power and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, being a wise man and a man who is in tune with the Holy Spirit, he goes right into prayer and he says in verse 9, for this reason... We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Paul never even met these people personally. He just heard about them from Epaphras. I marvel at the people that are praying for you and me that we don't even know who they are, but they know who you are. There's always someone praying for you and for me that God has laid our lives on their hearts that they might hold us up before the throne of God. Praying for the church, praying for the churches, praying for the ministry, praying for the pastors. Paul understood the importance of prayer and he did not cease to pray. Paul didn't say, well, I'll pray for you one time and never pray for you again. The Lord had the people on his heart continually and he was compelled to pray all the time. He prayed without ceasing. Because he wanted people to be clearly aware of the fact that there's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. He wanted them to understand that for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is ahead of all principality and power. If Jesus Christ is in your life today and you have been born again and you're saved, you need nothing else but Christ. Nothing else. You don't need any secret Gnostic books of Jesus spending some time in India that some wacko wrote. You know, if you really want to know who Jesus is, you need to read the, uh, these Gnostic uh, books. They're all heresies. They're all lies. All that we have and all that we need has been revealed in this scripture. A matter of fact, it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things, not some things, not a few things, but has been given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm wondering about what I should do with my life or what's life about or what book can I go find that will give me the answer, the hidden meaning of what life's about. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4 that we have been given. What a blessing. God has given to us his kids 
all things that pertain to life, how to live life, how to maneuver life, how to get through life, how to get through trials, how to get through depression and anxiety and, 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 and heartache and heartbreak. How do you get through these things in life? Through the power of God, through the word of God, all things that pertain to life. How do you become a Christian? You hear about it through the word of God. How do you live as a Christian? You hear about it only through the word of God. This is all you need through the knowledge of him, knowing Jesus more, knowing him more deeply, understanding his ways and spending time with him who called us, it's all of us here today that are born again, by his glory and virtue, by which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The great and precious promises of God have been given to us. They're there in the scriptures to discover, to spend time, to, to be enlightened, to all of a sudden get these epiphanies and these revelations. You're reading something and you see it for the first time and God clearly speaks to your heart about his great work on the cross for you and his life that is now living in you and how he wants to live through you. This has been given to us. Everything. We are rich people. That we don't have, there's nothing that God has held back from us as kids. He's given all of us this to enjoy and to experience. And so Paul's praying for them to understand these things. And he says, and to ask that you may be filled. Father, fill us today. Fill us every day with the knowledge of your will. How many times do you hear people say, I wish I knew the will of God, or I don't know what the will of God is. The Bible tells us here that you can ask that you may be filled, that means uh, overflowing, with the knowledge of what God has called you to do in your life, how to live, how to be a dad, how to be a mom, how to be an employee, an employer, how to be a brother, how to be a sister, how to be a servant, how to just be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can be filled with this knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Not in some wisdom. God says he's going to give you all wisdom. Lord, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know what decision to make. Maybe I'll call 30 people and see what they think. No, ask God. And God promises to give you wisdom. And he will give you spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. How can we live in a way that's pleasing to God? How can we live in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ? By asking him for knowledge of his will, asking him for wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then it says that you may then walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. You want to please the Lord. I know you guys do. I do too. And the only way I can please him is by knowing his word and obeying what it says. That's the only way. There's no other way. And when we're not in the word and we're not feeding on the word and we're not being immersed in the truth of God's word, there's no way we're going to be pleasing to the Lord. And he says, being fruitful in every good work. Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything apart from our relationship with Jesus Christ, our connection with him. We don't have the ability to overcome fear apart from abiding in Jesus Christ. We don't have the ability to love people apart from our relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't have the ability to have a calm heart and a calm mind in the midst of bad news apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you can't handle life apart from me. Without me, you can't do anything. And then the purpose of us understanding these things, and he's praying for this church, get away from the heresy, stop believing the lies, all this other stuff that will just mix you up and confuse you. Stay away from it. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. You know, you, you think of the, the, the story of Peter being able to walk on the water. He was really doing good when his eyes were on Jesus, right? 
He was stable in the midst of a storm and unbelievable torrents of wind and waves. It must have been this incredible. He was okay in the midst of that. He didn't sink. And then as soon as he got his eyes off of Jesus Christ, what happened? Lord, save me. I'm drowning. Help me. And that's the way my life is in yours. When my life is, when my eyes are on Jesus, it's unbelievable. I don't worry. I don't fear. I'm not anxious. I don't care really about really anything when my eyes are on the Lord. I just got a sense of peace no matter what. Peace in the middle of the storm, no matter what. But I'm like you. As soon as my eyes get off of Jesus, I freak out fast. Uh, when I, my eyes are off Jesus, I don't go down gradually. I am like right down quick, fast. And there's no help for me apart from getting my eyes back on the Lord. And this is what Paul is praying, praying for them, praying for us today as we study this. Thousands of years later, it's still just as relevant and present tense as it was when God first gave it and breathed it through the heart of Paul's life. And that we would be fruitful in every good work. So you look at your life and you evaluate it as I do, I need to. Lord, is my life bearing any kind of fruit for your glory? Will there be any evidence after I die that I've left something of significance behind because of how you caused me by your grace to follow you and live for you? And it's not the big things that you got to be concerned about. Who are you impacting on a daily basis in your life? Who are you able to love who's an enemy? Who are you able to forgive who, in the natural, you just don't want to forgive? This is the power of the cross of Jesus Christ in us. Christ lived this way. His testimony on earth was always this way. And he is in us now, living in us, and he wants to dwell through us so that we're representing him. And as his kids, everywhere we go, we're walking worthy of the Lord, pleasing him, and bearing fruit because we follow him. And every good work, and we then are increasing, it says, in the knowledge of God. The more you know the interior part of your life and your heart about who Jesus is, the more influence you're going to have, the more ability you're going to have, the more vision you're going to have, the more people you're going to touch and reach and impact and see God change just through your own simple, humble, modest life. This is the work of the Spirit. This is what makes the Christian life exciting and exhilarating because God is in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is here today to work in us and through all of us as we leave these doors shortly. And it's fascinating because you begin to see what he's doing and realizing that you have a chance to be part of it, but he's the one that's causing it all to come to pass. He's the one that has the setups and the connections and the conversations and the people he brings in and out of your life every day for a reason to impact them with the gospel. The, the simplest thing, going to the store, getting your gas, you know, at the gas station, running here, running there. Nothing's in vain when you're seeking God, like Paul's praying for them and praying for us, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Every day I'm going out, Lord, I want to know what your will is today. What's the setup? What's the plan? Who am I supposed to see? Who am I supposed to talk to? Who am I supposed to pray for? Who am I supposed to have an encounter with? Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. God, you got a plan. Give me spiritual understanding, God, to know how to Deal with what it is that's coming at me that I don't know how to deal with apart from your wisdom and your understanding. And that, Lord, today I might be able to walk worthy of you and please you and honor you. I was so blessed when I sat down with Nick and Deanna and their heart was, we just want to be servants. We just want to be pleasing to the Lord. That was with their heart to me. It wasn't any kind of aspiration of some kind of big Christian school. They just want to touch one life if they can and be a servant to people and let that school ministry be an outreach to a world out there that doesn't know what they're going to do with their kids tomorrow. They're afraid to put them on the school bus. We're so glad you tuned in to Living Waters of Grace today because we know any time spent in Scripture is well worth it. In this edition, as well as many others, Pastor Clark has been pulling nuggets of wisdom out of the book of Colossians and life applications for us to learn and live by. From a Roman prison cell, the Apostle Paul received a disheartening report about heresy in the Colossian church. So he composed a letter, which we know to be the book of Colossians. 
Paul greets his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, urging them to remember everything they learned and not deviate from it. Understand that blasphemy was starting to run rampant in those days. This sounds not too different from today. By culture, we're told to define what's true for us. Or how about this phrase, you do you? And of course, there's also, you deserve it. All of these lies are centered around ourselves, not a creator God who has given us new life and freed us from sin. When we lean into these lies, we lose sight of the transforming power of Jesus. I, for one, want to remain steadfast in the hope love and security of Jesus Christ. How about you? Before our time is up for today, know that this is a ministry outreach of Calvary Chapel Westmoreland in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, where we are on mission to glorify God and love well. If today is the first time hearing us, please go to calvarychapelonline.com to learn more about who we are and what we believe. While you're there, take some time and look around. Before you leave that site, be sure to download our mobile app so you can listen to more messages like this one anytime. Come back for more on Living Waters of Grace.